Well, good evening, Saints. It's good to be with you once again as we continue in our study of the Book of Acts. This is Pastor Kevin from Calvary Chapel of Pittsburgh, and we've been going through the Book of Acts uh, for the last few weeks, and we are in Chapter 4 tonight. Chapter 4, so you want to uh, grab a Bible or a device with a Bible app on it and get to Chapter 4 of the Book of Acts, uh, and that's where we will fellowship tonight. Uh, first let's pray then we'll get into the Word of God father thank you for your word thank you for the goodness and wonder of your word thank you for the history of your working uh, among your people Lord uh, as recorded throughout the scriptures and especially now as we are looking at the book of Acts and see how you sent the Apostles and your followers out into the world to take the message of the gospel and spread it to the whole world. And so Lord, we thank you for that. Pray that you would bless our time by your Holy Spirit as we consider the things in chapter four of the book of Acts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Okay, uh, chapter four, uh, at the end of chapter three, we saw uh, Peter and John at, at the beginning of chapter three are on their way to the temple. And uh, uh, that was the place where the early church gathered in uh, a place in the outer courts called Solomon's Porch or Solomon's Portico. And that's where they would gather. They would gather and pray. Uh, as Jews, they would continue to participate in the sacrificial system. God would bring revelation over uh, the next years uh, and bring along this amazing guy called uh, Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul. Uh, to give the revelation of the fact that um, there's a new covenant and the old system was just pointing to the new and that the uh, one sacrifice for all had been given. And, uh, and then the Lord in AD 70 uh, brought the Romans in to destroy the temple so that the sacrificial system could not continue. But at this time, they were still gathering in, in uh, the temple uh, for prayer, for fellowship, for the things we saw in Acts 2.42, for uh, the, the apostles' doctrine, uh, koinonia, or fellowship, the breaking of bread, and uh, prayer. Some of that was taking place in Solomon's portico. As they are coming into the temple, they see a man, beggar, who we find has been uh, lame since birth. He's about 40 years old, and he is uh, at the entrance of the gate called Beautiful, and he's asking for alms. He's asking for donations to help him. And Peter and John come by, and, and uh, they look at him, say, hey, look at us. He looks up at them expecting something, and Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they take him by the hand, lift him up, and he is instantly healed and begins walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people who saw this and recognized the man are amazed, and they rush after Peter and John and encircle him. And, and Peter uh, says to them, hey, why look at us? Why are you surprised? Why do you marvel? And why do you look at us as if we've done something? And then he preaches the gospel, he preaches the resurrection, he preaches Jesus and that it was in the name of Jesus. And by faith uh, in that name and by the faith that comes through that name uh, that this man was healed and uh, uh, calls people to um, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says that um, there were, uh, there were uh, well, we'll find this out in, in chapter four, that this encounter brings either the total or an additional 5,000 men to faith uh, in, in Jesus Christ. So amazing time. Things are happening and people are being gathered to the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, he has just said, um, 
turn away every one of you from your iniquities. And verse 1 of chapter 4 says, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So again, whether that is in addition to the 3,000 that were saved on the day of Pentecost, another 5,000, or whether the total had, had now risen to 5,000, counting men, not counting women and children as well, which would add uh, multiply that by two or three or more to come to the total. A lot of people are coming to Christ. This is a big thing happening in Jerusalem. And so the priests, the captain of the temple, the, the head of security, so to speak, and the Sadducees come upon them and, and, and take them uh, and put them into custody into the temple jail for the night. Uh, the Sadducees were one of the uh, parties of the leaders of, of Israel. And uh, the, uh, they were the ruling party at that time. The Sadducees uh, did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in miracles. They did not believe in afterlife. And so they were greatly upset that someone was preaching the resurrection from the dead um, in, in Jesus. And so in verse 5 it says, It came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? So this is the Sanhedrin, the group of 70 plus one high priests, and they were the ruling body in uh, Jerusalem for all of uh, Israel, at least all of um, uh, Judah at that time, and, and, and for all the Jews. And, and it was recognized and empowered by the Romans. In fact, um, I believe it's Caiaphas who was appointed by the Romans. He and Annas, there was some uh, relationship there through marriage, I believe. Um, but both of them were um, high priests and the leaders, but they were, uh, they were corrupt. They were totally corrupt. When Jesus upset the uh, money changers' tent, uh, tables in the temple, uh, when Jesus went into the temple and did that, those, uh, those tables were called Annas's tables. Um, they, that's where one of the major uh, sources of income into the temple was in the upcharge for changing common courtesy currency into um, temple currency so people could give in the temple uh, and there was a there was a tax on that or the markup on uh, the animals that were sold there that were under the control of uh, of the temple uh, they were making money that way and so um, they gathered together in this group of 70 and the way the way they would gather together they were um, in, a, in a semicircle in levels so that they would be seated on multiple levels, each a little bit higher than the next kind of amphitheater or large classroom uh, or lecture hall style. And it says they put them in the midst, meaning right down in front, in front of them all. And so uh, in verse six, uh, or verse seven, it says, and uh, when they had set them in their midst, they asked by what power or by what name have you done this? You know, I was thinking about this. Um, the Jews revere still today the name of God. Uh, they will not say it. They will not write it. The Old Testament manuscripts do not spell out Jehovah or Yahweh, but instead only have the, va the uh, consonants, and then they put little points to identify the vowels, and because they want to revere the name of God, they, they uh, have such, um, such reverence for the name of God. And so 
uh, that comes up here because here's the second time where they're talking about uh, the name uh, of God, the name by which this happened. Uh, it, in chapter 3, back in verse 16, when Peter is explaining how the man was healed, in verse 16 it says, And his name, meaning Jesus, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And yes, the faith which comes through him has given him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So reference to it was the name of Jesus that is identified as the power here. And now the, the, um, uh, the Sanhedrin is saying, by what power, by what name have you done this? Anyone who was around and observed when Peter and John actually uh, healed the man, when the Lord healed the man through Peter and John, they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So now they say, in what name or what power have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, and in the original language, uh, it, it, the, the word for filled means being filled, being in the state of being filled. Peter had been filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And it, it says he stood up in, in the midst of all the rest of the disciples on the day of Pentecost, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, being filled. And, and it's, it, it's a case here, too, which says to us, um, we should always be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It isn't a one-time event that uh, we have and then we own something called the Holy Spirit, but we should be constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit empowers us. And it says, he filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, uh, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be made known to you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, and now I, I just can imagine him looking right at Annas and Caiaphas and the others who were there when the Sanhedrin was gathered uh, illegally at night when Jesus was brought before them, uh, and uh, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and I'm sure that would cause a, a murmuring or a gasp or some kind of reaction from the Sadducees, who uh, were the majority there in the Sanhedrin. By him this man stands here before you whole. What a powerful, powerful testimony by Peter of the power of Jesus Christ and of the power in his resurrection to the very ones who turned him over to the Romans uh, to be crucified. How powerful. And power uh, through a man who... Uh, just a little more than a month before that, had hidden uh, his identity, tried to hide his identity, and, and was kind of found out by a servant girl uh, to whom he lied and cursed and, and then eventually ran out of the courtyard uh, where Jesus was being questioned. Uh, and now here he is before the most powerful rulers in Israel, and he is declaring... You want to know how this man stands before you? I'd be glad to tell you uh, through the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. That's the power that has made this man whole. Then he goes on in verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Now that's a reference to Old Testament Psalm 118. There are some other Old Testament references to the fact that the the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And uh, Peter is saying that Jesus is that stone that you rejected that has become the chief cornerstone. Uh, nor is there salvation in any other. Now, listen to this. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. No other name under heaven given among men. This is, this is powerful. This is 
um, to many sitting in the Sanhedrin, that would have been blasphemous to say the name of Jesus, some guy from Nazareth. You're saying that's the name uh, where not only the power that raised this man, uh, healed this man, but now you're saying there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved? What about the name of God? What about Jehovah? That would be racing through their minds as they're hearing him. Verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So this says to me that probably the man who was healed was tossed in the clink along with Peter and John. Imagine the, the time they had uh, in, in overnight, uh, the prayer session, the, the sharing, the sharing of the gospel to this man so that he knows not only was he healed, but he must be saved through the name that healed him. And now he has been standing with them before the Sanhedrin. Now he, they throw the three of them out. And notice that it says they saw the boldness of Peter and John. And when, we think, when I think of the word bold in English, I think of courage. I think going forth in, in power. And there's, there's, that's part of the sense of the Greek word that's used here. But there's a bigger sense. It's not just power and courage. Uh, which certainly is evident here, but it's, I heard it said that it's speaking uh, also about the ease with which Peter was speaking about this. He wasn't wrestling with what am I going to say? How am I going to react to here? Let me think about this for a minute. But just the ease with which he responded. There was no, uh, give me a chance to think this through, guys. Come on, it's been a rough night. But rather, he says, oh, you want to know? Let me tell you. And he boldly uh, speaks to them, not only with courage to speak to them uh, in a way that I'm sure some of them would probably have thought was uh, irreverent, not giving them the respect that they, that's due to them in their minds, but he's speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what the Holy Spirit gives, is that boldness for uh, us to be able to witness, for us to be able to share the hope that is within us, whether it is in some stressful situation before powerful people like Peter and John before the Sanhedrin, or whether it is in, in a gentle conversation with someone, that the Holy Spirit empowers us uh, to be able to speak boldly, not just to not be scared to share, but to, with, with an ease of being able to just say, oh, well, this is it. This is it. Peter later says uh, that we should be ready to give a, 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 an account for the hope that is within us. A, and that's what they're doing with ease. Just to, they, it, it just came out because of the Holy Spirit. That's how we are ready is because of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says when you're called before uh, rulers and, and powerful people, uh, don't get freaked out and worry about what you're going to say and try to make up something ahead of time. The Spirit will give you what you need to say at that time. And this is an example of that being uh, of a happening uh, through Peter and John as well. We're not told if, if and what John said here, but we're told what Peter said. And so they send them out. Uh, they perceive that though they had boldness and an ease to speak, yet... It says that they were uneducated. Okay, so you, you guys didn't come here to Sanhedrin school or temple school to learn all this stuff. You're, you're not educated. And untrained men, and, and there's a sense in which they're looking at these guys, they're Galileans. These guys are fishermen. These are just ordinary guys. How do they have this boldness? How do they know to, quote, uh, the Old Testament scripture about the stone that the builders rejected. They're, they're marveling at this, and they're amazed at it. But most importantly, it says, and uh, they recognize as seeing, uh, they realized that they had been with Jesus. 
when Jesus was in the temple courts for uh, the week before his crucifixion, they were with Jesus. Some of these guys in the Sanhedrin would have been walking the courts of, of the temple and listening. And they, uh, the Sadducees and, and Pharisees and priests came and questioned Jesus to try and trip him up. And the disciples would have been there. Peter and John would have been there. So they're recognizing them. But I take this a step further. And though people for us today as believers in Jesus Christ may look at us and say, hey, you never went to Bible college. You never, you don't have some PhD uh, in doctors of divinity. Who do you think you are? You're just uneducated uh, Paul said to the Corinthians, you know, look, look at us, the church, you know, not many, not many wealthy, not many highly educated, so forth. God uses those who are the willing, including the educated, but here they recognize this, uh, the Sanhedrin does, people will recognize that in us, that who do you think you are? You know, you're talking to me like you know about the Bible. What do you know about the Bible? What do you know about God? Looking at it that way. But may they also recognize that we have been with Jesus. And um, in fact, the, these who are supposed to be the most perceptive in Israel are not perceptive in this, that they say they perceived they were with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. No, they were with Jesus then as well. And they couldn't perceive the Holy Spirit upon Peter and John. So they sent them out, uh, verse 15. They commanded them to go aside out of the council. They conferred among themselves, saying, What are we going to do with these men? Indeed, for indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. We, we can't just sweep this under the rug somehow. We can't deny this is an amazing miracle. Everybody knows who this guy is. Everybody knows him and knows what has happened. But so that it spreads this, so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak no more. No, uh, that sorry, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. <laughs> what a way to throw it back on them and to say, no, <laughs> no we're not going to listen to you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, so they threatened them and they said, you judge whether we should listen to God or listen to you. They threatened them further. They let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went their own... They went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why do the nations raise and the people plot vain things? They're quoting Psalm 2. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. 
This word boldness has shown up several times here. The Sanhedrin perceived that though they were uneducated and untrained, uh, these guys had been with Jesus and they were speaking boldly. Peter was speaking to them boldly, not just courageously, but in power and with an ease that it just came forth. And then uh, they are threatened and let go and they go and they pray. Uh, that's a good place to go when you have gone through what they've gone through. They performed a, a miracle. The Lord performed a miracle through them. They're arrested. They're kept overnight in jail. They're brought before the equivalent of the Supreme Court of the United States to and questioned, and they boldly answer and, and uh, testify to Jesus Christ, to the ones who physically and actually had uh, condemned him to death. Uh, and they're threatened not to do that anymore, and they say, yeah, we have to. We're going to say what we have seen. And so they go and they pray. They don't go to figure out what the next step is or to put together their plan of attack to come against what uh, the ruling party is uh, doing to them. Instead, they pray. And take a look at their prayer, how powerful it is. And I heard it mentioned that this is the first prayer that is, um, we have the words to the prayer uh, by anyone in the church. And so it begins by saying, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and that all that is in them. Let's set the context of what's going on in our lives. All this has happened and we are being threatened by the powerhouse of our nation. But you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in it. That sets the context. That's who we're talking to right now. Far above all principality and power and rule and anything that can be named, including the Sanhedrin who's now threatening us. And then they, they quote the word, and I believe this is by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that uh, the Holy Spirit leads them to understand um, that what's going on, it, the Lord has already identified that this is going to happen. This is one of many fulfillments of the prophecy uh, in Psalm 2. And... Uh, we could look at our world today and look at the way that Christianity, even in my lifetime, ha has gone in America from being a, a, a given, from being a, a, a standard within the nation, even for those who are not Christians, uh, who, that, that has been, had been given deference in, in my childhood by uh, ruling the ruling powers and so forth, that in, in these two generations uh, since I was born, or into the third, I guess, if you count my generation as one, uh, Christianity has, has suddenly become uh, a, a byword for hatred, for bigotry, for ignorance. Um, the, the rights of the, of the church and of Christians are being attacked again and again and again. That's the world that we live in. And this is why. Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? Kings of the earth, rulers uh, of the earth, take their stand and rulers gather together against the Lord and against his Christ. Now, when you read Psalm 2, it's, it, it's interesting to go back and read that. We won't tonight uh, for sake of time. But it's interesting when you read that because the, the Lord, it says the Lord laughs at them in derision. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You're, you, you're, you're taking a stand against me. We see the finality of that in the book of Revelation when uh, Satan uh, gathers all the armies of the world to take a stand against the Lord himself. It's like, are you kidding me? Step back and think about that for a minute. And, and so they begin with, Lord, you are the creator 
heaven and earth and the sea and everything that's in it. And why do the nations rage against you and against your anointed one? And then they go on and say, yep, truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, the people of Israel gathered together. And now listen to this amazing insight. To do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. There's both sovereignty of God and responsibility of man. The fact that the sovereignty of God used the very actions that were not righteous in the least of Annas, Caiaphas, the rulers of the Sanhedrin, the people of Israel who cried for Jesus to be crucified, um, the Romans who carried it out, um, his sovereignty did not direct them to do that, but his sovereignty used their sinfulness to accomplish an amazing thing. And his sovereignty did not excuse them from their responsibility for their actions. We studied Samson on, on Sunday. Same thing. The man was called to be a Nazarite to, from his womb and to live that out in his whole life. And he never really fully fulfilled that. And yet the Lord used him and the Lord gave him supernatural strength at specific periods of time because the Lord was using him to judge the Philistines who were ruling over uh, Israel at the time. And so the Lord did not invite Samson to do the things that he did, but the Lord used those things to accomplish his freeing Israel from the uh, tyranny of the Philistines. But it didn't excuse Samson's responsibility for the things that he had done. It's the same thing in our lives. The Lord can use parts of our life that aren't right, and yet he can use that for his glory but it doesn't excuse our responsibility. Interesting to consider. And so um, they understand that. And, and they say in verse 29, Now, Lord, look on their threats. And, and they didn't say, and smite them for what they're doing. Or make them impotent, Lord. Or raise us up. Or do any of this. Look at what they say. Look on their threats. And grant, they're not demanding, they're asking for the Lord to grant them something. Grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Grant that we might speak your word with the boldness that was evident to the leaders of Israel when we stood before them earlier this day and declared who you are and what they had done and that there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Grant us that boldness, continuing boldness. And they say, uh, from their perspective, how to do that? By stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. They just saw this whole thing play out, going to the temple, just going to worship and gather with the people, they see the guy at the gate, beautiful. The Lord, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Peter and John to uh, say to this guy, hey, rise up in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk and to lift him up and then see him instantaneously healed and then thousands gather and hear the gospel and many respond to it, but then get arrested, thrown in jail overnight and then brought before the Sanhedrin. They have seen how all of this worked and they saw how this one man being healed that had touched thousands of people with the gospel, not with just the story of the healing, but the healing was something that nobody could deny, including those who wanted to deny it, who wanted to hide it. They said, we can't deny what has happened. This is a, a tremendous miracle that has happened. We can't deny it. We can't hide it. We'd love to, but we can't. So they're saying, Lord, keep it going. Keep it going, Lord, by healing, by signs and wonders. But their prayer 
is to be able to speak the word of God with boldness because they have been changed and they want to see others changed through the power of the risen Christ. That's what they're about. And that's what we should be about today. That's what we should be praying for. We shouldn't be praying for this political party, that political party, this political agenda, that political agenda. Yes, we should participate in this country, absolutely, and be aware and let God lead us and direct us in how and to what extent we participate in the government. We are to pray for the government. We are to pray for our leaders. We are to give respect to our leaders. Um, both Peter and Paul in the epistles talk about being in submission to authority, the, uh, even the governing authorities above us, except when God says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, and the ruling authority says, you can't, you can't preach the gospel. You, you can't preach in his name anymore. Okay, then Peter said, all right, it's a matter of higher authority. You tell me, should I follow God or should I follow you? as a man. That's what, and that's laying it out. It's as simple as that. But we're not called to raise a ruckus and there, there are some Christians or some Christian groups that I've encountered in my years of being a Christian who feel called to come against the, the governing authorities uh, when they are not being righteous, that the governing authorities should be following the laws of God. I wish they would, but you know what? Earlier, they prayed that, Lord, you determine what should happen using governmental authorities who were unrighteous and did unrighteous things. So you put them in place to do those things. And you put the ruling authorities in place to arrest us so that we could witness to them. But this was not a mistake. This was not... God's plan didn't work. This is God's plan, his sovereign plan. Amazing, amazing. And so what should we be doing in the midst of the ridiculousness that we live in today and the continuing attack from the world against true Christianity? Hmm. We should be praying. We should be praying for the boldness, the the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be being filled, that we might speak the word of God with boldness and see him confirm the gospel by signs and wonders. That should be our prayer. Because you see, the world is a mess and there are evil people in this world, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And they don't know it unless we tell them. May God help us not to fall into the trap of fighting against the world in our strength or our own wisdom, but rather to take up the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith, the sword which is the word of God, and go forth in his power, not to smite the enemy, but to gather people to declare the truth of God and direct people to him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the encouragement of your word. I pray that you would lead and direct us to continually pray for your boldness, the boldness of your Holy Spirit to inhabit us, to empower us, to propel us forward in our lives, to declare the gospel everywhere we go and with everything that we are and that we have, to be able to see this world touched by you, to be able to see lives changed because of your goodness and your power. Lord, grant unto us that with all boldness, we may speak your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you. I pray that you would be 
uh, filled with the goodness of God and that you would know his grace each and every day of your life. Amen. Oh, I walk.